The title of this program is New Trends in Diagnosis and Management of Glaucoma. My name is Murray Fingeret, and I'll be doing this, this module with John Flanagan. The first section that I would like to talk about is glaucoma management in and around perimetry. But let me just back up and talk about how we diagnose and manage glaucoma. The diagnosis and management of glaucoma includes a battery of tests that are done. Well, when a person presents for a comprehensive eye exam, there are ways, reasons that we may be suspicious, such as if we measure the intraocular pressure and it's elevated. There are other tests that we want to include for part of this test battery, and that will also include just the case history. Is there a family history of glaucoma? If so, how many individuals, who were they? Does a person have an ocular history that may put them at risk of developing glaucoma? such as use of steroids, ocular trauma. One of them measure the intraocular pressure, and if it is elevated, pachymetry, the measurement of the cornea thickness, becomes important to put the eye pressure readings into context. A thick cornea may have an elevated or higher eye pressure, but in particular, if we have thin cornea, that may explain a lower pressure if we see the signs of glaucoma. If we are suspicious about glaucoma being present, we need to do gonioscopy just to evaluate the anterior chamber angle to understand if there's any reasons why it, the eye pressure may be elevated. We then want to look at the optic nerve, a dilated assessment using a stereo lens, and then we're going to document. And documentation may include every, you know, using photographs of photography as well as imaging with the OCT. And in that case, we're looking at the optic nerve and the nerve fiber layer and the macula. And if we are suspicious of glaucoma being present, then we're going to include perimetry, where they're doing it with the 24-2 or the 10-2 or the newer test pattern, the 24-2C. You know, here's an example of a person, and if we look at their, their eyes, we can see that inferiorly, right at about in the right eye at about 7 o'clock and the left eye at about 5 o'clock, we can see nerve wedge nerve fiber layer defects along with a thin rim, a larger cupping, greater on the left side. And that would be the tip off as we're doing our comprehensive eye exam. First time I'm seeing this person and I say, wow, glaucoma is probably present. Want to measure then cornea thickness, already done the IOP. Imaging is going to be useful, documentation with photographs even, or OCT, and visual fields for us to understand what's going on. Here's this person, you can see the wedge defects inferiorly in both the right and the left eyes. The nerve fiber layer is thin. And we did not just the ganglion cell, not just the optic nerve of the nerve fiber layer scan, but even the ganglion cell, the macula test. And it's telling us that there's loss on both tests. Want to then do a visual field, and here's the person's visual field, seeing that there's a right superior arcuate type defect going right through fixation. And that correlates with the nerve fiber layer appearance. And here's the left eye, also an arcuate defect going right through fixation. This actually is technically what you would call a partial arcuate, that it doesn't appear to extend, missing just by a point, right to the blind spot. So as we talk about glaucoma, this is the glaucoma continuum that Dr. Weinrab had put together many years ago. And it describes the natural history of glaucoma developing and what we see clinically. And that's that the nerve and the nerve fiber layer changes will be first, followed later on by visual field changes. And that, that's the way we, you know, I would think about it. Think about the nerve the nerve fiber layer changing, the macula changing. You know, while we have listed here SWAP and FDP or FDT, we really don't use those tests on the threshold mode as much to recognize change as we do looking at perimetry. What this is we're looking at is this is a paper that, that, that comes out of the New York group talking about retinal nerve fiber layer and visual function in, in glaucoma, the tipping point. And the point, you know, that, that this paper makes is that optic nerve changes 
neurofiber layer changes, in this case is measured using the OCT, will occur. And when we think about when a visual field defect is seen, what they show is that visual field loss occurs when the average RNFL is in the neighborhood of about 75 microns. So that's significant change. But it gives you the idea, the context of when field loss will occur when glaucoma damage is present. And that's what you're seeing in this particular figure. On the x-axis, you're seeing the nerve fiber layer, the average nerve fiber layer. On the y-axis is visual field, in this case mean deviation. And on the far right, in the top right corner, that's a healthy normal eye. And as glaucoma starts to develop, you can see the line going down slowly. And there's slow change, but the line, as the nerve fiber layer is being lost, you see there's very little movement in terms of fields. Fields are barely changing. And that's somewhere around 75 microns. And there, you know, there, there's a certain amount of variability in the measurement is when we see that steep drop off and that's when visual field loss starts to occur. This is a paper that was written by Bob Weinrab and, 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 and Andrew Camp. Will perimetry be, for, be performed to monitor glaucoma in 2025? And they talk about, if I can read it, visual field testing has played an essential role in the diagnosis and management of glaucoma for more than a century. Methods to examine the visual field have been refined from early kinetic perimetry to the current standard automated perimetry or SAP. Clinicians now use SAP for the diagnosis and management of glaucoma throughout the world, and various testing paradigms and analytic methods have been developed to simplify the diagnosis of glaucoma and the interpretation of progression. Moreover, strategies have been implemented to improve patient experience with visual field testing and to increase reliability. Tests are getting faster and faster, and we'll touch upon that. Objective functional tests such as electroretinography, electroretinograms, provide an alternative to subjective visual field testing but are not yet ready for widespread adoption. Standard automated perimetries are being adopted and approved constantly, I should say adapted. New devices may allow patients to complete visual field tests even at home, which could relieve patients and clinicians from in-office testing and allow for more frequent examinations. Finally, perimetric and structural testing likely will become more closely intertwined as testing platforms and progression analysis incorporate both of these measures. Visual field testing will continue to be an important role in the diagnosis and management of glaucoma. So that really sums up as we think about the visual field and why it's not going away. It's going to remain an important part of how we take care of our patients that either we think are at risk of glaucoma or have glaucoma. So why perform perimetry? Well, one, we want to recognize glaucomanous damage. It's a measurement of glaucomanous damage that allows us to stage the disease, mild, moderate, or severe. We use the amount of field loss to determine the management, such as target IOP. When should we see the patient? How should we monitor them? Greater amount of field loss, probably need to, you know, to keep a closer up watch on them. We're, we, perimetry allows us to monitor for change over time. So this is an example of a very old, one of the original Humphrey printouts going back 25 years ago. The reason I incorporate that is if you look way on the bottom, you have see shading, scaling of gray scales, and that's what the, that's what the gray scale is made of. And what you can start to see is it's a certain decibel range that will lead to a certain shading. So it's important to keep that in mind. So when I think about this, the, the field test, I think about the steps that we need to analyze these. And I have six steps for analyzing, but it actually I've modified it back down to five. We have the right test, reliability, reviewing probability plots. Um, think about the nerve fiber layer pattern of loss. And we want to reaffirm the diagnosis. So I'll talk about each one of those briefly. Here we're looking at the newer printout, and with the newer printout, I just, you know, just pointing out what everybody has seen, that we no longer have any shadings on the bottom that correlate to the, the, the raw scores of decibels. So 
What's the right test? Well, the strategy is do we want to use CETA standard or CETA fast or CETA faster? And you'll hear a little bit more about that as we go on. You know, traditionally, uh, historically, CETA standard was the way to go. We then, over the last couple of years, have moved to CETA fast when we realized that there was very little loss of information going to a quicker test. We're now looking to move even to a faster test, CETA faster. And that's going to allow us to do a newer test pattern we'll be touching upon the 24-2C. And I'll go, you know, and, and the next question is do we do a size three or a size five? But right now we're still on the size three world. And unless there's advanced loss, we don't usually go to the size five. That may change down the road. We have test patterns of the 24-2 or the 30-2, the 10-2, 24-2C. Well, let me just start why I really went to a 24-2 years ago. We learned that there's very little, there's nothing really gained with a 30-2 in terms of that additional row of points. And there's a lot to lose because it takes longer. And that's where we tend to see artifacts such as the, the lid or a trial lens defect. 10-2, an interesting test that a host of people, including Don Hood, have shown that in early glaucoma, central points may be flagged with the 10-2 that we don't see with the 24-2. We want to make sure we're doing the right eye and haven't put the right age, because if you put the wrong date of birth in, that can lead to problems with analysis because the normative database is, is based on the age. Want to make sure the pupil size is large enough, at least three millimeters. And we'd like to be consistent in terms of the pupil size, test to test to test. Refractive error, if you are doing it manually, make sure it's input correctly because that's another situation where if it is put in improperly, the instrument may end up having some artifacts caused due to that. We now have the liquid lens, which is a feature, a great feature, that allows once the, the refraction, refractive error is put in, then the, that power is automatically calculated. You don't even need to use trial lenses. So now we go into the reliability indices. And the reliability indices are going to include the fixation losses, false positives, and false negatives, as well as looking at and analyzing the gauge tracking, which on many devices is found on the bottom. Fixation losses using the hail crack out or the blind spot uh, tracking method was historically what many clinicians looked at as the most important part of reliability indices. Um, but it can be, you know, it can be affected. In with CETA faster, it's no longer going to be present because there are some artifacts in getting away going to case tracking. False positives, which will be around and are not going anywhere, is the best indice. That's a way to see if a person is clicking away or not paying attention, measuring their reaction rate. And as little as 5% of a false positive rate can be significant. False negatives are also no longer going to be present with CETA faster, though the clinician can always turn it back on, but it's going to add time. The reason why false negatives are not a particularly good indice is that it can be fatigued due to, it can be affected due to fatigue, lack of attention, but also when there are field defects. The way a false negative works is that the point is rechecked with a brighter light a little, a little later in the test. And you would think if a person saw it earlier, they should easily see it again. But in glaucoma, when the, for example, the cones are damaged just due to the glaucoma, they don't regenerate. That whole process isn't that quick, and the person may not see the point on retest, not because they're not paying attention, but because they have glaucoma. That's what happens to the glaucoma in the cells. So false negatives, if you're not careful, can be misleading. And that's why gaze tracking trying to move through. So here, when we look here, you know, we have fixation monitoring, blind spot checks, but if you look on the very bottom, that's the gaze tracker, that line. And you can see a couple of blips, a couple of lines going up as that it extends out. And there are, you know, what, seven, eight, nine times that the person did look around, but that actually is really pretty good. It's actually excellent 
can see how lined, how steady that line is. So that's pretty good right there. Um, look, because that's over a couple of minutes. So that's a good test taker overall. Even with a couple of fix, couple of blips, still that's that that's that's very good. The other thing that I like to look at is just see if there's a zero right in the blind spot region. And that tells me that the person had very good fixation. And when the blind spot was plotted, they weren't moving around much. So if I see a zero where the blind spot, you know, the, the mark is, that gives me reinsurance also. Here's an example of false positives, unreliable visual field test. And in this case, when you see more points flagged, on the right side, that, that's the pattern deviation side than on the total deviation side. And you can see this, there are two examples here. That's an unreliable field. The false positive rate is elevated. You can even see in the grayscale, there are white marks. Those are called white scotomas, where the actual raw scores are in the 40s, 50s. Not humanly possible to be seen. This is a person who is just clicking for the sake of clicking. They're probably anxious, but this field you can't use. You can say, well, on the left side, you see, well, it looks like an inferior arcuate. Maybe I can use it or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it down the road. You can't do that. That field has to be rechecked and it just is not, it's just not usable. Some patients, you can just slow them down and educate them and explain that just take their time. They're not going to see every point. And with, with, with experience, they may do better. Other patients just are bad test takers. Not many patients are like that. In that case, you need to concentrate more on other testing, such as OCT and looking at the nerve. Here's an example of an artifact. And you can see it looks like maybe that was a lid on the top field. The second field, it really looks like it's a trial lens defect. And we finally got a little better in that it kind of cleared up on that third test. This is a field that looks like in the middle, there is a, a, probably a trial lens defect. There's still some defects on the third test and the fourth test. It's clean. That's a learning curve. It can take several tests before a person becomes ex you know, experienced with it. And that's why you got to be careful if you see defects on the first particular test. When we review the probability plots, think about the global indices as well as the glaucoma hemifield test. Look at those. See if they are flagged. Bear in mind, glaucoma is an asymmetric disease, and we talk about it being one eye compared to the other. One eye tends to start first, but even in this, the eye where it's developing damage, it's asymmetric in that it tends to start on one half of the hemifield as compared to the other. And that's what the glaucoma hemifield test does. We want to review the pattern deviation plots. Where are they flagged? Here's an example of a person who has a lot of points flagged. If we look on the lower left, all those points flagged in the total deviation. None of them flagged on the right side. That's a cataract, and that's widespread loss. It could be also due to a tiny pupil. But on the pattern deviation side, nothing there. That's the money plot. And it doesn't appear to be much, if anything, there. And that would, you know, and I would do an exam, and I know this is my patient, and there was a small cataract there. As compared to this field, where you compare the total and the pattern deviation plots, the, the symbols, they looked similar. That tells me there's no cataract. The person was a good test taker, and that's why they both are, are comparable. And when we look on the bottom, we can see the gaze tracker, that line, there's almost no movement at all. This was a phenomenal test taker. Also, note on the grayscale that only at the very outer edge are a series of points flagged or black. Even though when you look at the, at, the, at the probability plots, it extends all the way to the blind spot. So you may say to yourself, well, what do I believe? What's accurate? Is it the grayscale or the pattern deviation plots that are showing me the extent of damage? And in this case, you gotta believe the pattern deviations plots. So we have global indices also to look at, and I have mean deviation. Mean deviation is not a particularly great DVA, a great probability indice or, or great mean, div, mean indice, um, a global indice, because it can be flagged due to having a cataract. It can be flagged due to uh, not taking the test properly. So just because it's reduced doesn't in any way tell you what the cause is. The pattern standard deviation indice is a good indice for early glaucoma. 
And as glaucoma develops, it's going to go up. But it's going to peak about at 11 or 12 dBs. And then if the glaucoma advances, because this is a matter, this is going to be a measure of local change. And as glaucoma gets worse and starts affecting both hemifields, it's going to go back down to about zero. So bear in mind, Steve, that the PSD is a plot of glaucoma being present. It is not an indice that will tell you severity. The severity is the visual field index. And the visual field index are weighted plots based on the pattern standard deviation side and weighted based on the test location. And 100% is considered a very good or healthy field. And it goes all the way down to the blind field being zero. So it's one of a continuum. And then the GHT, whether it's outside normal limits or, or normal or borderline, that's an indice, that's an indicator if there is loss present comparing hemifields top to bottom. And that's also a very good indice. So here's an example of a field where the GHT outside normal limits, and you can see why that is, because most of the loss is on the top end, nothing in the bottom. What you also can see is if you look on the total deviation side, all those points are flat. That's the type of, of field we see with a cataract. And note, this person has both the cataract as well as glaucoma is damage affecting the superior field. So when we talk about the nerve fiber layer type of pattern, on the left side, we're seeing a beginning partial arcuate, but it's a lot smaller. And then on the right side, it's also a partial arcuate in that it doesn't quite make it to the blind spot, but it's a little denser. So with that, what I try to do is talk about the way I would look at visual fields, my analysis methods, the things I think about in terms of the steps I will use to interpret fields. Bear in mind, we have a lot of new changes, and those changes will be discussed further by Dr. Flanagan as we talk, for example, about the 24-2C. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about a couple of new things in perimetry, specifically CETA FASTER and 24-2C. We've had the, uh, the perimeter, the Humphrey Field Analyzer, with us since uh, 1984 and a couple of iterations. And in, in 2015, the Humphrey Field Analyzer 3 was launched. And there's been some significant updates just very recently. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk to you about CETA FASTER, uh, specifically CETA FASTER 24-2, because it's not available in the 30-2, and also CETA FASTER 24-2C. And also the fact that with these new programs, we can actually, uh, in our guided progression analysis, we can mix all the various different CETA protocols uh, to ensure that we can uh, use our old information, our old clinical information, uh, along with these new programs, and that's obviously very important. So CETA FASTER tests uh, the 24-2 in, in usually around two minutes or less. Uh, it's 50% faster than CETA standard and around 30% faster than CETA FAST. Clinically, it's uh, pretty much equivalent to, the, to CETA FAST. It's basically based upon the same CETA algorithm and uses the same normative data as CETA FAST. But there's various tweaks that were made to CETA FAST to make it faster. In the original CETA FAST and CETA standard, um, there was much longer breaks between stimulus uh, presentations that are taken out of the CETA FASTA. Um, also, that there's no blind spot check and there's no uh, check of false negatives. False positives uh, are used still as a quality monitoring catch trial, uh, and gaze monitoring is used to check through fixation. There's been a major publication that outlines these changes, a multi-center study um, that looked at CETA-FASTA versus CETA-FAST and CETA-STANDARD. Uh, the title is a new CETA parametric threshold testing algorithm uh, its construction and a multicenter clinical trial. So this was just released, and the purpose of this study was stated as to describe a new time-saving threshold visual field testing strategy, um, which is intended to replace CETA-FAST 
and to report on the clinical evaluation of the new strategy. So we can see from the, the first table from that paper that there's a significant difference, as we might expect, between the, the test times and also a little bit of difference uh, on the VFI. Uh, other than that, the, most things were pretty similar. Test duration here, you can see the distribution of test times across all of the uh, participants in the study. And we see consistently down at the bottom there in the blue squares, uh, CETA faster uh, being the quickest algorithm. Somewhat of a comfort, you can also see that uh, each of the tests classifies the visual fields in a similar way, gives a similar level of, uh, of defect, and certainly is uh, really no different than the sort of performance that we see if we were comparing um, CETA standard to CETA standard or CETA fast to CETA fast. The conclusion of the paper is that CETA faster saved considerable test time. CETA faster and CETA fast gave almost identical results. And there were small differences between CETA faster and CETA standard, but of the same sort of magnitude and the same character as between CETA fast and CETA standard. So CETA faster really does genuinely seem to be uh, uh, give us very, very similar results. The only thing that the, you'll find a slight difference uh, is um, sometimes an, uh, an, an increase in the number of uh, false positives that we see. And that's really just given with the, the speed of the test uh, that with some patients you get a few more false positives. The really great thing uh, going forward is that we can use the uh, CETA faster results in our guided progression analysis. And we can see here an example um, of using a mixture of CETA standard, CETA fast, and CETA faster, uh, and still being able to mix for both the baseline and for looking at our both trend and event analysis. As we see in this particular case, the uh, additional uh, macular defects showing up on the CETA faster final uh, data set at the bottom of the field compared to the two baseline results at the top. I'm just going to show you a quick, uh, quick case here. We've got a 54-year-old uh, Korean woman, um, normal tensions, 5, 15 and 14, corneal thickness normal, gonioscopy normal, but we can see very dramatic uh, notching of the rim and, and nerve fiber layer defect. No surprise that that's confirmed in the, with the uh, inferior uh, defect shown on the nerve fiber layer analysis here. Here we can see her defect really threatening fixation. And this, of course, is the sort of uh, presentation where we've always been encouraged to look at the 10-2. And here you can see the 10-2 in this particular patient. See really just how serious the, the defects are here uh, in spite of the patient's young age and relatively early presentation. But we can see these really, uh, really worrisome defects threatening fixation on this 10-2. And of course, one of the problems is we've never been able to really follow progression in 10-2. We don't have the analysis uh, in order to, uh, to really monitor change in the 10-2. We can just measure the field. And just a reminder of where on the visual field these uh, uh, test patterns cover. You can see in the blue here, the 24-2, you know, covering over that central 25 degree uh, area of the visual field, and we can see in the red dots there the 10-2. Uh, and there's very few. There's really just uh, just really four points that overlap between both the 10-2 and the 24-2. So when we measure the 24-2, we really uh, really are not looking at uh, very closely or very carefully at the macular region. Growing evidence has suggested that. Uh, some of the defects we see in the nerve fiber layer um, that we're not seeing defect in our 24-2 with our 6-degree grid can be found if we measure with a, a 10-2 and, and really look at that macular area in greater detail. Because of that and this growing need that was identified to, to try and really measure uh, macular points a little more carefully, there was an expert group put together to look at um, what evidence existed in terms of where we should place locations if we wanted to get extra information by combining additional macular testing with a traditional 24-2. 
And, and here you see that the uh, test locations that we eventually ran with are shown in the red boxes. And so after quite a bit of time following this uh, expert group meeting, there was modeling and, and, and additional, additional work to really look at the um, ability of these points to detect the early nerve fiber layer defects that we sometimes see. And these are the 10 points that were selected. You know, the evidence suggested some points would not, were just off, slightly off from 10-2 points, but they were always very close. So again, a strategic decision was made to align the points that gave us the most information um, with 10-2 points so that we could uh, make sense and have the data available that would link in between this test and the 10-2. Uh, so on this particular image, you're seeing the large gray dots of the 24-2 pattern, the large orange dots of the 10 additional uh, locations from the 24-2C, C standing for central, and the small dots, the small gray dots being the uh, traditional 10-2 pattern. And there's not a lot of publications yet about the 24-2C, but the, there was a, a poster presented at Arvo uh, just a year ago that looked at um, the ability of the 24-2C to, to measure some of these locations. And we'll certainly be looking at some cases uh, shortly that will um, really identify or, or illustrate how well the 24-2C can work in some cases. And here we see an example, a right eye on the left, the 24-2 um, CETA FAST, um, and within normal limits uh, in terms of the glaucoma hemifield test, um, and no real obvious visual field defect. But with the 24-2C, you can certainly see that uh, there are several clusters of points that we'd be more concerned about that may match with the macular defects. So the 24-2C is there to, uh, or FASTER is there to minimize time. The 24-2C is to minimize time with CETA FASTER but maximize information and give us more information from the uh, macular region. So the 24-2 CETA FASTER um, saves us about 30% from CETA FAST. The 24-2C is about 20% faster than normal CETA FAST 24-2. The 24-2C is not available for CETA standard. And really the, the idea behind that, or for CETA FAST for that matter, but the idea is that we're really planning to standardize going forward with CETA FASTER. And this is really because of evidence base showing that even if CETA FAST was perhaps a little more variable on a single visual field, over time and looking at progression, it's no worse than CETA standard. Uh, so the idea of measuring more fields with the time you have being better for this idea of looking at progression. So it's being standardized that CETA faster is just on the 24-2 um, and just the 24-2C is only available with CETA faster. I wanted to finish off just putting a slightly different twist and looking at some structure function. This is a, an amazing uh, paper that was published a few years ago uh, in IOVS that did some fairly high resolution uh, mapping with OCT and then looked at the visual field, 24-2 visual field, and looked at predicting what the visual field might look like purely from the OCT data. So here on the right-hand side, looking at the top, the early glaucoma, then moderate in the middle, advanced glaucoma at the bottom, this is the group average of the participants in each of those groups. And what we see is the average measured visual field on the right side. And in the middle there, you'll see the predicted visual field. You can see how close the match is by predicting the visual field simply from structure. And if we look here, we can see a remarkable set of raw data, far too much 
information on the slide really, but if you pick up any one of those pairs, whether it be in early, moderate or late, in each of those pairs the field on the right hand side is the measured field, the field on the left hand side is predicted from imaging, predicted from OCT. I know there's a few times where there's mismatches, I think you can see most of the time. It's really quite remarkable how similar the visual field that's predicted from OCT um, compares to the measured field. So where's this leading us? What am, I, what am I getting at here? Well, one of the problems with our guided progression analysis is needing good baseline, needing good data, and more data to get us going with our visual field. So if we could add in predicted data from structure, from our OCT measure, uh, how might that save us time, for example? So we know that if we have a prior field, if we know what we think the visual field looks like, we can save 20 to 30% on our test time by using that data um, in an intelligent way to seed and predict where we might be with our measured visual field. So it just, uh, just this idea of using structure to predict function and get us started down the road to uh, a quicker visual field testing. So I think we'll see some really exciting developments in, in this sort of area of, uh, of perimetry and visual fields. I think also we may well start seeing mixtures of target sizes, perhaps bigger target sizes that give us give less noise and less noise measurement error uh, in our patient measurements and may allow us to again see progression a little sooner if we're measuring with bigger targets that that give us less noise and a and a greater range of measurement. So I think we've got some exciting times ahead. Um, Available now to you is Cedar Faster uh, and the Cedar Faster 24-2C, both I think significant contributions uh, towards our, uh, our clinical care of our glaucoma patients. So next we're going to look at some cases uh, together with Dr. Murray Fingeret, and uh, I hope you enjoy the idea of, of measuring our fields faster and with more information in the macula. I'd like to start off with the first case, an 84-year-old who, who presents for a comprehensive eye exam. The last eye exam was a couple of years before. Has a father who has age-related macular degeneration. His viv visual acuity is, is, is good, 20-25 in each eye, low myopia, pressure of 18 in the right, 19 in the left. And this is the right optic nerve. And you can see right off the bat the nerve is, is suspicious. And here's the left eye also with a suspicious optic nerve. The analysis is that this is a large optic disc. The instant rule is not obeyed. There is some parapapillary atrophy. I don't see any signs in the photographs of nerve fiber layer loss, but the OCT you know, will probably reveal some if, if it's present. I don't see any disc hemorrhages. Pachymetry is 549 in the right eye and 537. You know, pretty close to average left eye, maybe a little thin. And here is the pachymetry uh, uh, printout from the cirrus. Here we're looking at the OCTs for this particular person, and, and it, it is a good quality scan. Large disc. You can see that there's nerve fiber layer defects, inferior temporal in both eyes, the, the right and the left eye. You uh, can see that when we, when we look at the uh, thickness maps, the deviation maps, can even, you know, the Tisnet curves, we can see it down in the uh, quadrant and sectors. And here's the ganglion cell, also showing some loss, both eyes greater on the left. And these are the paddle maps that combine the nerve fiber layer and the, uh, the ganglion cell maps. You can see they don't quite line up. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're off a little bit. In this case, they're probably off a little bit, but you can see, especially inferiorly in both eyes, how the change extends from the disc all the way out past the macular region. You know, this person, is this person has, is a suspect or does this person have primary open angle glaucoma? 
pressures are never really elevated so far, but I wouldn't really call this normal tension glaucoma because, you know, or I would be careful. I mean, I, on the first visit, I would want to have additional IOP readings before I, I come to that conclusion. I would like to repeat the IOP. I'd like to do gonioscopy. I'd like to do fields. And the person does return for us to do it. And still, the IOPs are not elevated. And we do a CETA fast. And you know, there are a couple of points flagged on top in the, in the right eye, fairly reliable field. In the left eye, it's clean. I'm not sure if those points flagged are real or simply learning. It is a good test taker. And here, if we look at the left eye, we can see the gaze tracker is, you know, you know, is almost spot on. This is where combining the OCTs with the visual fields, and you can see that the inferior loss in the right eye with, with that wedge defect you can see in the bottom left corner may correlate with that visual field change superiorly, though I would want to repeat the field either way. So as we look at this structure function printout where we have OCTs as well as the fields, John, would you like to make some comments on this? Yeah, you know, the, one of the really interesting things on, on, on this printout, it shows really nicely what sometimes happens when uh, you have a big disc. It can happen with a small disc too, in the opposite way with a big disc. You see how the, uh, the double humps on the uh, Tisnet plot are just a little offset from the normal data. You have to morph the, the peaks a little in your mind just to sort of align those over the normal data, just to make sure that we're not over-interpreting. So it, it just, again, makes you question the, uh, the, the red flag um, on that inferior uh, rim a little bit. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and we'll see on the pano maps that, that there probably is still some defect there. Uh, but we have to be careful when the disc right. is either too big or too, or too small. Okay, great, John. And, you know, my assessment of this case is that this person really does have beginning glaucoma with thin nerve fiber layer damage noted on the OCTs, I do believe that glaucoma is present and I would like to you know, consider therapy for this particular individual. And with that, let's, we can move on to our next case of a 70-year-old Hispanic male who first presented in September of 2018 with a pressure of 26 in each eye, average corneal thickness, and if we look at the optic nerve here we have the right nerve. One of the things, in addition to the drusen scattered throughout the, the posterior pole, we can see here at about 7 o'clock this wedged nerve fiber layer defect we can see in this, this particular picture. And in the left eye, we also can see a wedge type of defect right again at about, in this case, probably about 6 o'clock. There is some scattered drusen um, in, in addition to that. So, you know, that heightens, you know, my feeling that, and, you know, glaucoma is present. And when we do the OCTs, we can, we can pick that up, that we can see that there's a wedge defect inferiorly, that there are areas flagged in both eyes. In the left eye, we're seeing areas flagged both inferiorly and superiorly. That extends out into the macular region. Um, here's the macular cube, and there is areas that are, that, that are flagged on the GCC in both eyes. And these are the panel maps. And in this case, especially in the right eye, they line up nicely, showing how the nerve fiber layer extends out right past the macular region. And we see similar type of change going in the left eye. Here we're looking at the 24-2s, and this is the, the combined printout. You know, there may be some early field loss, maybe. And here we can look at the fields, and here's the right field, not the best reliability. And here we're looking at the 24-2C, and perhaps there are some points flagged in the macular region. Here's the left eye, 24-2. You know, it looks like there may be some points flagged in the 24-2C. So as, as we come back and, and look at this case, as we look at the 24-2C in the right eye and the left eye, there, you know, there may be some loss that's showing early change that, that does correlate to a point with the OCTs. With that, 
you know, John, this is mm. the end of this particular case. Anything else you'd, you know, you'd like to note? Yeah, Murray, this is just a, a, an absolutely classic case. Thank you for this one, because uh, the, the, it really shows the pano maps and how useful they are. And uh, really striking on the, uh, the macula map from the OCT, that real step function that we can see in the macula sometimes. Right. And then on the 24-2C, uh, it's just, a, again, beautiful example of how you know, we can miss things in the 24-2 and that we're seeing a uh, clear defect that match beautifully with, uh, with some of the nerve fiber layer defect. And see this little cluster in the center that just wouldn't have, wasn't there on the 24-2. Uh, right. This is really a perfect case to illustrate the, uh, the usefulness and the function of the 24-2C. I think it also is one of those great cases where you can see you know, cons what looks like considerable loss in the nerve fiber layer, and yet what we're seeing in the visual field is still relatively subtle, but measuring those central points is really helping. Right, that structure function divide that mm -hmm. we, you know, we see quite a bit in why we need to, you know, to use both OCTs you know, and, and as well as visual fields. Yeah, I think Don Hood would be proud of you with this case, Mark. Yes, Don would like it. <laughs> <laughs> This next case is an 82-year-old African-American male, pressures presents, pressures 25, pachymetry, average, maybe even slightly thicker than average, and get the idea that there is quite a bit of extensive cupping. In the infrared image, you can get an idea, a better idea of the extent of, of the loss. Left eye, a little better picture, and you can see the extent of the loss with the, the infrared images again. And here's the serous OCT, where we can get an idea that there is some change starting to occur. It's being flagged as, you know, we can see what appears to be in the right eye some superior temporal loss, and the left eye perhaps some in, inferior temporal loss, as well as just temporal loss, um, that, that are being flagged in several places. The fields are clean in the right and the left eyes. And here we're looking though at the 24-2C where we're starting to pick up some loss both in the right and the left eyes in, in a reliable field that was not present previously. And then what I would do, I would go back and look at and say, you know, does this make sense? I mean, it may, especially in the left eye, you can see that there is extensive inferior nerve fiber layer loss so this again highlights, or this highlights the utility, the new type of tests, and how the 24-2C may be detecting loss that we didn't see with the, the 24-2. Yeah, no, another great example. It, it also highlights one of the things we have to be a little careful with. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you, this, this is presenting as glaucoma. But if there's macular defect, Sometimes that may, you know, we haven't, we must be careful yes. of over interpreting the 24 2 C that some of the loss could be through macular yep. disease. So we just have to make sure that it does fit that structure function uh, map in the clinical picture of glaucoma as well. Yeah, no, good point. But, you know, that's exactly it. Whenever you're doing these, these, these central tests, yes, you got to be cognizant that you can have points flagged that have nothing to do with glaucoma that could Absolutely. be flagged due to macular loss. The next case, this is a 59-year-old African-American male recently diagnosed with primary open-angle glaucoma using Lumigan and Simbrinza. It has a medical history of high blood pressure, um, elevated cholesterol, untreated with 17 and 16, has thin corneas. With therapy, we've gotten the treatment down to, the IOP down to 11 and 12. And again, we have some scattered drusen, suspicious optic nerve, right eye, Suspicious optic nerve left with scattered drusen. And here we have the OCTs. And the OCT, the nerve fiber layer is really thin. And these are, these are good, reliable OCTs. And we're seeing a loss in both sides and significant loss, both superior and inferior loss. And this is how the 24-2C, and we're seeing this loss, this change, that, that would correlate with the OCT pattern. What's, what's really obvious in this case is how most of this loss is not detected, not picked up with the grayscale, and yet we can see it on the pattern deviation map. In the left eye, there's left, less loss, and there's less loss in the left eye, just some points flagged inferiorly, 
And if I go back and look at the left OCT, that may correlate that, you know, you know, may not. It's something that we, we just need to, we're going to want to repeat the testing just to confirm this, these, you know, this particular pattern. Clearly the nerve is suspicious and I wouldn't be surprised if there was field loss, but I also wouldn't be surprised if there is not. This is the structure function maps. So tying it all together, how you can look in, in, in one view at the field and the OCT. Um, so with that, in summary, this is another example of how we can combine a series of tests together. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. One of the things we should point out, Murray, is, is how different the total and the pattern deviation actually look uh, between the, the traditional test uh, and, uh, and, and the, the new C test. And that the, the only way that you can visualize in the total and the pattern deviation the, uh, the significant points or the significant level is by them making those squares much smaller. So when you flip from one to the other, you can really see that, uh, that change in, in just in, in the pattern. Yeah, because there are so many more points there. Yeah. And, and grayscale, you know, is, uh, particularly with these subtle macular defects, the grayscale doesn't always show it up. Yeah. That's a like here. really great point. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a 61-year-old diagnosed with primary open angle glaucoma 2018. IOP without therapy, 32 and 30 in the left eye, average pachymetry. The person also gives a history of being hit in the eye um, with a choreal retinal scar. And uh, so I always think about possible angle recession glaucoma in this particular case. But, you know, note that there's loss. The IOP is elevated in both eyes. With therapy using lantanoprost and Simbrenza, the pressure's 12 and 11. Here's the right optic nerve. And it appears that right about seven o'clock, there is a, a, a nerve fiber layer defect that's developing. Um, there may even be something up above even at 11 o'clock. It certainly looks like there's a notch developing. In right, there. up yeah. there, yeah. yeah, if I go back. Yes, there is. Or an inferiorly. Inferiorly, yeah, there is clearly. a notch. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. And here's the left eye. And in this case, there's a large chorioretinal scar. And bear in mind that with, with that type of chorioretinal scar, there, you know, there will be a field defect associated with that. Um, what's interesting is, though, is that the nerve fiber layer defect, the nerve fiber layer, you know, surprisingly is still relatively intact in that particular area. You can see on the right side how thin the nerve fiber layer is, how there's loss, as we had suspected, both up, a, up above and down below. And we saw that as we pointed out those, that nerve fiber layer loss uh, in both locations. And it extends out, so there's ganglion cell loss both in the right and left eye. You know, the left eye, again, is probably in this case related to that scar tissue. Here is the OC, I'm sorry, the, the visual field, and in this case, the 24-2C for the right eye, seeing how extensive the loss is, and the loss is greater in the superior region. And that would correlate with you know, probably a little denser loss inferiorly, though not really that much denser. And here is the loss, the field in the left eye, and this field is probably in large part you know, related to that, um, or at least in part, that chorioretinal scar. You know, how can we differentiate chorioretinal scarring um, versus glaucoma defect? Well, the big point here is that a scar shouldn't get worse. And a, and, a, and a field, uh, if it's due to glaucoma, field loss will. So a person can have two mechanisms of why there is field loss. And here's, you know, an example of just looking at the, uh, the right eye, both with a, a traditional 24-2 and the 24-2C, just to compare how the, the, those, little, those few extra points give a little better resolution. And the same thing with, you know, with, with the field loss, comparing the 24 and the 24-2C in the left eye. So with this, you know, here's an example of a case where, we're, where we, we, when we do these, you know, these multiple tests, you can see how, what the 24-2C, you know, can offer. So John, um, you know, any, you know, what other points, any other points you would like to add to this? No, I, only the, 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 the question you asked about how do you, how do you identify when it's the chorioretinal scar versus a, a nerve fiber layer defect for the uh, glaucoma. And 
one thing to look at, and I think this case shows some of that, is that when it's something like a chorioretinal scar, something uh, really you know, old and established, you get very steep-sided defects yes. and, and really deep defects. And in, as our arcuates develop in glaucoma, they tend to be more relative. Right. So that, the, there's, that's the one little hint here that it's right. probably more to do with that chorioretinal Excellent scar. point, and you can see how steep-sided the, the edges of this particular mm -hmm. you know, defect are. Yes. Another another great case. Good. Thank you very much. Hopefully, you know, with these points, you know, we you know, we can wrap up, you understand, you know, where, you know, how fields can can, can combine with OCTs to come to the diagnosis of individuals with glaucoma.